Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore. And I'm thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome Dash Shaw for a discussion of his new, new, his new book, Discipline, um, out now from New York Review Comics in conversation with Greg Hunter. While we're eagerly awaiting the return of in-person events, virtual ones like these continue to be a joy for us at Community. So I wanna give a special thank you to our guests for joining us this evening and to all of you at home for tuning in. I'd also like to extend our thanks to the American Comics Journal, who will be publishing a transcript of tonight's conversation. Now to some housekeeping, uh, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. Um, there's also a chat button through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book, which is, of course, very important. And one caveat is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any te technical issues that might arise and we'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we've scheduled a whole host of fall programming for you at Community Bookstore. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is next Thursday, October 21st, another NYRB event. event. We're thrilled to welcome Benjamin Labatut for his National Book Award shortlisted novel, When We Cease to Understand the World in conversation with Lawrence Weschler as part of a series of conversations for the Venice Architecture Biennale. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. Finally, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. Now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Dash Shaw was raised Quaker in Richmond, Virginia, where he currently lives. He's the cartoonist of many graphic novels and wrote and directed two animated feature films, the most recent of which, CryptoZoo, won the 2021 Sundance Film Festival's Next Innovator Prize and will be distributed by Magnolia Pictures. Shaw began working on Discipline in 2014 and it was drawn over the course of six years. And Greg Hunter is a writer based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He edits graphic novels for young readers and he has contributed comics criticism to the Comics Journal the Rumpus, Los Angeles Review of Books, and other publications. His new book, his book, New Realities, the comics of Dash Shaw, will be available soon from Uncivilized Books. So now without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Dash, Greg, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks. Yeah, I thought I would start just by showing some, uh, some images from, from Discipline so people know what we're talking about because the book is pretty new. This is the, the cover of the book. Quakers at this time, they're, they're the only two art forms that they really practiced were um, silhouette portraiture and quilt making. So I tried to limit myself to those for, the, for this cover. This is what the insides of the book are like. There's lots of scenes in meeting houses. And if any of you have been to one, you know that the, the kind of gutsiness involved in standing up and speaking out of the silence. So that's what is going on here on the left. Um, and she's speaking out against the war, um, saying that, you know, the, that um, you don't overcome an enemy until you've made them your friend. And that doesn't happen when you kill, kill that enemy. That was um, for, there was a rift in the Quaker community about whether or not to fight. So she's speaking against it. Many Quakers did fight. Um, the text from the book mostly comes from actual um, Quaker letters and diary entries uh, that were at the New York Public Library. Um, in their manuscripts and archives division. So the book kind of feels like a long collage of um, found altered text into a narrative that's the conflict inside of the meeting house and the conflict in the, um, the physical conflict that the boy's going through. This is. The drawings float, um, which is, I hope doing a few things at once. One was just kind of how I put the book together because I didn't, I, I wanted to be able to research things and gather material um, instead of like, instead of just planning the whole book for a year and then trying to execute it over years, I needed some kind of way 
to have the construction be more fluid. So I would draw scenes kind of not knowing exactly how they would fit in. So then piecing it together kind of felt like a collage. That's one part of it. Another part of it is sort of like the Civil War era specials, the, the journalistic illustrators, um, the way that they would draw. And then a third part of it is I hope it feels like the uh, silence of the page, the negative space of the page is activated in, in some way that's unique. Like the book was drawn, you know, over so many years that the drawing on the right side of this page was done in 2014 and the drawing on the left was done in 2019. And I didn't know this would be the transition until it kind of aligned one day when I saw it could go from the arms of the mother and father to the arms of the boy. And um, so that was a nice uh, moment. This is from a chapter in the book that's really important. That's the sister, that's a mostly wordless chapter that's kind of suggesting things going on with the sister that she's not putting into the letters to the brother. That's all. All right, well, we will begin the interview portion with that, uh, and that's, that's a convenient handoff. Uh, Dash, you just discussed the kind of unusual construction of the narrative of the book, uh, how the book uh, kind of revealed itself to you uh, over time to some extent. Um, uh, and I'm curious in terms of that discovery process, um, if you ever reached a point in drawing the story when your storytelling instincts might have led you in a certain direction for a character or a scene, but uh, discoveries about the historical record then uh, push back or put you in a different direction. Um, you know that was kind of the whole the whole thing where you know I when I first started it, um, I thought, okay, I have an office at this at the library. They have a ton of material here. I'll be able to make something kind of like, I love the Chester Brown book, Louis Rial. Um, and, I, and I thought it might be something like that and that it's explaining this moment in history in a very kind of clear way, um, literally like a clear line kind of way in his case. Um, but then when I, when I got into the, uh, the letters and diary entries, the, it was this mind warp because, uh, you know, I think some people as they research things, it becomes clear, maybe, maybe Chester Brown was like this, like he, he had kind of a confident idea of what was happening. Um, but as I researched this, it actually felt like it became less clear where mm -hmm. someone, I would know that someone went through a battle that day, but their diary entry would just be what they ate or the weather. Um, and there, I would know all about, you know, what this person was like, but their diaries would be something completely unrelated. Um, so then I had to kind of restart the whole book, thinking about the book. Um, and that was very, very confusing. And, but it kind of ultimately, you know, probably do, probably someone else could have would have looked at that material and been able to make a book that is more, um, I, don't, I hate to use the word normal because it me is so meaningless, but um, something I guess more explanatory than, than mm -hmm. my book. But I think, I think my personality led me to make something that's more about the dissonance between what people are saying or thinking about or writing about versus what they're doing. And then when I realized that's the driving, almost the, con almost the conflict of the book is what people are doing physically versus the, the text or what they're writing about. Then I thought, um, you know, that only came from the letters. It wasn't a plan I had going in. Um, you know, and then also, again, I'm sure just due to my personality, I really liked the letters where I didn't under couldn't understand really what they were saying. Those were the most exciting letters. Um, you know, if I, 
the talking, you know, even almost sometimes not being able to read the handwriting, <laughs> like any kind of level of sort of like of of uh, a mis you're looking at this past and there's something mysterious about the people in it and you don't know how much they're like me, um, then that was exciting. The, uh, yeah, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, and, and just the notion of those, uh, you know, diary entries as um, like, like the products almost of real life unreliable narrators is a fascinating thing. Um, I, along those lines, you are for, I don't know, lack, lack of a, a less embarrassing term, you know, like a comics auteur, you know, someone who uh, uh, I think has a deliberate approach. Um, uh, the books all feel like the product of, you know, um, some pretty uh, rigorous work and, and of like a pretty cohesive vision. So I was curious using uh, these sorts of found texts, if if that process, you know, just complicated your feelings of authorship at all, if, if it felt like a collaboration in a way that's distinct from the earlier works. Huh. That's a really, I know what you mean. Um, that's really interesting. You know, uh, I guess there's a few, a few things. Um, I feel like uh, and maybe making animated movies has helped me lean into this direction, but I feel like I'm an orchestrator or arranger of different elements. And so when it came to the text, even if I didn't necessarily write that text, I'm still, uh, I'm still directing it. And, uh, and you know, for, for CryptoZoo and these movies I've made, like I'll storyboard it, um, but I don't necessarily have to be the person who's painting a particular background. If I can, if I can find someone who would paint it better than me, great, you know. So the the that kind of authorship of it, um, I felt like is I, I'm I'm the the orchestrator, the collage artist kind of person. You know, uh, it's kind of funny saying that though because I do think with these books it is important that I draw, draw every, I don't really have the, the impulse to be a writer who makes layouts or whatever and, and find an art. But I, I, so that part is important, but um, that's only maybe because I wanna be in charge of all of those arrangements. Um, yeah. No, uh, uh... In my book about your work, uh, New Realities, the comics of Dash yeah. coming sometime in early 2022 now. Uh, from oh, no, it doesn't. So it's, wait, have, I, you know, I haven't held one in my hands yet. Oh, no, me neither. It's, it's the supply chain thing. Um, but I, I, which I, one argument I, I make about the books, your books in that book, um, is that usually a biographical reading of them is not going to be the most fruitful way to think about them. Uh, and I still generally think that's true, but discipline complicates that idea um, because you're separated from your characters by more than a century, but knowing that you had a Quaker upbringing and that this is your first graphic novel to feature a Quaker community, I was hoping you'd share some thoughts about how you found yourself bringing, you know, an experience of Quakerism to the story and how much of your own experience you see reflected in that final work. Um, yeah, F first, I feel like I should zoom out and say, <laughs> And just publicly, for the record, say, you know, thank you for for writing that book. And I, while I haven't held it in my hands yet, I, you know, read a PDF and and I said this to you too that I felt like I that um, you know if there if I had if I have one complaint, it's only that it's about me. You know that <laughs> that, that that I was very grateful. Um, I'm. I'm, of course, I'm flattered that it's a, about me and it's, it's, or not even, you know, I think it's cool that it's about me, but um, there's so, I feel like there's so many cartoonists that are, that, you know, this, that are after kind of the people who got those books about them, Chris Ware and Dan Klaus, um, that are very deserving of having someone go through their work, whether it be Kevin Heisenga or 
you know, Gabrielle Bell, I can, you can name lots of them. So I hope that, um, you know, yours is one of many of these books that, and, and it's very cool that Uncivilized published it. Um, but the, about the, I also, you know, um, the biographical reading, this, I can, I can blab about it, you know, I feel like if you grow up um, in those meeting houses and you have to spend an hour in silence when you're three, four, five years old, you just get a, a different relationship to silence. Um, and it felt like I had this muscle in me that was strong over 30 plus years of doing that and that I got to use it in this book, meaning I, I don't think someone else could have drawn those meeting house scenes that, that the, the negative space and the kind of activated silence, um, I think, well, I, I could be delusional or something, but if it, it, it doesn't matter because it felt to me like I was using something that was inside of me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very, very exciting. Um, it also uh, kind of, it's throughout the book and it kind of keeps the book, um, I, don't, I don't know if I could, you know, to me, it keeps the book consistent in its kind of treatment of silence and these things emerging out of the silence. Whereas otherwise I think it might, it might just be a bunch of stuff, um, a bunch of scenes, a bunch of text. And similarly, um, you know, I growing up in Richmond, I felt very, very early on that there, and many people have said this about Richmond, that it's a haunted city, that the, the fallout from the Civil War is ever present in the, in the humidity of the air, you know? Um, and it's, it's it, unaddressed ghosts were in this city. Um, so that, again, felt like there was something that I was tapping into, but uh, I couldn't make any, um, claims beyond that, meaning um, the, I, you know, I don't know how interesting it would be to try to, um, you know, go through my diary and point to particular things that would make me want to do something or other. It would probably, it, just like the diary, you know, the diaries that we were talking about earlier, it would probably only confuse things um, and I always find it, even, even when I'm talking right now, um, you know, it's, I'm an, I guess, even remove myself, you know, often when I'll hear another, uh, a cartoonist or an author speak about their work, I'll think that's not true. Like, <laughs> I, I know what, you know, I saw your book. I know, you know, to me, it's obviously more about this than what you're saying. So, um, so I'm sure I'm probably just as delusional or misguided or, or maybe I'm uh, finding something that sounds like it's a good thing to say, whereas I was actually doing some other thing that I'm not aware of. You know, the unconscious is such a huge space that, um, uh, I, I kind of take what, you know, when an artist talks about their motivation or something, I find maybe the majority of the time, I just find it not worth, um, not worth hearing. <laughs> well, let me ask you, uh, something slightly more concrete than, uh, since you mentioned Richmond, um, and, uh, hopefully this is clear to the listener, to the viewer, but, um, Richmond is, uh, where you're from. Uh, it's also where some of the story's uh, bleakest scenes take place. Um, I was uh, curious, uh, you know, like I said, more concretely, do the, do the remnants of Libby Prison still exist in Richmond? Yeah, I, no, not the remnants, but I went there and it's a plaque on the floor of a parking mm -hmm. lot. 
Wow. So it's, it, uh, you know, the past few years obviously have, have really kind of really helped this. You know, I live a couple blocks away from Monument Avenue. So all of that going on felt like it was addressing its ghosts when for many, 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 many years, it was kind of um, just on, you know, in the ground, in the earth, just sitting there at your feet. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Now this is uh, obviously a Civil War book uh, and uh, you know, there's there's a, a consistent aesthetic and a consistent approach throughout. But you know, uh, at the same time, there's real contrast between those meeting scenes and the scenes of wartime combat. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, Louis Riel by Chester Brown, um, and that uh, you know, drawn reportage contemporaneous to the Civil War uh, was a point of reference for you. Um, of course, there's a long tradition of war stories in comics too. Um, you know, high points like the work of Jacques Tardy or Harvey Kurtzman, uh, also a lot of stuff that's, uh, you know, closer to propaganda. So I, I was curious in drawing the book um, uh, and with respect to combat scenes or, or other elements of war, if you had any other significant uh, comics reference points. Well, you know, so the, the, the maybe not comics, but the specials were a huge deal. Um, because the library also had um, their actual sketches. So you could see how, Al, you know, Alfred Woe drew like his drawing, the scale of his drawing, how he would use text in it, and then see the resulting um, etching that was in, you know, Harper's Weekly or whatever. So, um, because before I got into it, I would be like, why does all Civil War era illustration look the same? Like, it looks like they draw the same trees. And, you know, it's really a result of this production line where there would be a team of etchers and there would be like the tree guy who's doing the background trees and taking um, the different artists sketches and almost like a Hollywood production line or more mm -hmm. like um, an inker, you know, uh, like an inker with a strong hand going over um, different artists pencils and interpreting it in their own way. So the thing um, that was key was uh this is getting really really well i'll just i feel like this is really in the weeds but i'll go for it um you know i couldn't draw something so dense to be like those etchings mm -hmm. not only would i have not have been physically able to do it but i don't think it would read um and then i don't want it to be uh, like Tintin or Louis Riel, like I didn't want cartoony face, cartoony little beings this happening to. So I tried to find some kind of sweet spot where it's realistic enough and there's enough of these things with this quo quo lines that it feels appropriate, but also feels like it's happening. And that's like a weird thing that I think maybe only people really keyed into comics get but there's a difference between seeing something that's frozen, frozen moments in time versus something that feels like it's happening in front of you. And maybe the happening in front of you part feels more like um, Japanese comics that are decompressed. I can't really say, but I, need, I wanted it to have a happening in front of you feeling, especially when you're drawing some of these forests where you're like, I want it to feel like, oh, maybe it was drawn in a forest. You know, it feels, has some of that vibe. Um, but that, uh, that Civil War era illustration, you know, John Tenniel is one of the most famous examples of, of this, where it's like groups of lines depicting space, but there's key information missing, such as some, someone standing on a, um, on a floor and there's like a group of lines that's the shadow, his, his or her shadow. And then those lines suddenly move up at a certain point. Um, and that's, we recognize it as the point where the shadow meets the wall, but we're missing the line that's the edge of the floor with the wall. We're only getting those groups moving up. So there's whole spaces rendered in this kind of freaky way that um, was developed um, in like groups of hatching, describing things 
So uh, I thought that mode inside, um, you know, a panelless comic where all of the space is kind of activated is, uh, would be um, ap appropriate for the book. And this is uh, uh, more of a comment than a question, I'll, I'll say up front, uh, but you're, you're describing, um, you know, like I said, the, the contemporaneous illustrators um, and uh, far on the other side of whatever spectrum and that is, you know, tin, tin style, lean, clear artwork. Um, I think that, that idea, that the idea of that spectrum intersects in an interesting way with your body of work um, in, as, in as much as uh, we see hatching from you in this book in places to, I think, a greater degree than in, in most or, or any of your other graphic novels, uh, which I found really just effective in this context um, in, in conveying something like, uh, like the weight of a human body in the midst of these scenes that also have a ton of negative space that that otherwise have a certain airiness to them that uh you we get that we get that sort of um literal and and visual silence but at the same time there is like a real tactile quality to the book that you know that i think uh you know pairs well with the contents of the book too about the the effects of war um uh and along those lines uh I'm going to provide well, some. Oh, well, I wanted to say, you know, uh, a lot of that was taking a drawing and photocopying it and then hatching it in a bunch of different ways and then trying to find the right level of hatching that was still legible. Um, because especially in this book where like your eye is scanning through it to pick up text, you know, it, the text isn't kind of highlighted inside of word balloons. So if you rendered something in a denser way, your eye would just kind of spend more time on that um, part of the picture. So, uh, and it, well, you know, thanks, but it was, uh, kind of, it was kind of interesting to just have like five versions of one drawing and pick the one that felt like the best for, for, the, for the book. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to lay a bit of background for people who haven't read the book yet about this next question, uh, a big part of the story is the, the disillusionment of your character, Charles. Um, it's one of the you know, two major arcs in the story, along with uh, the life of Charles' sister. Um, Charles breaks with his community to join the Union Army because he recognizes the depths of the evils of slavery, um, you know, but as the book proceeds also finds himself disturbed by the process of war, even, even uh, arguably, you know, dissociating from it, um, how, um, you know, seeing how union tactics affect civilians um, and just the basic sight and experience of doing violence to another person. Uh, and for people who haven't read the book, there's a parallel to something like Slaughterhouse-Five, you know, in that Kurt Vonnegut, expects a reader to understand implicitly the horrors of Nazism, but also, you know, conjures some moral revulsion about the firebombing of Dresden. Uh, um, and part of why I wanted to talk about this is because, you know, some of the discursive platforms on which people are maybe going to be talking about this book can have the effect of flattening conversation, you know, uh, like Twitter is not always the best place for nuance and it's possible to imagine a reading of the book uh, that reduces it to like a both sides in, of the civil war. Uh, I don't think that's what it does. You know, for me, I saw it more as mounting an argument, you know, that the means and the mechanisms of war, you know, can, you know, degrade a person morally, uh, regardless of the war's purpose. But I, I did want to know, you know, what kind of apprehension you felt, if any, about that aspect of the book um, and ask, you know, what sort of reactions you've experienced so far. Well, first, I felt I felt apprehension about kind of everything involved <laughs> involved in this book, which is part of what made it so hard to to work on. I second and third and fourth, you know, everything about this. So uh, there's no uh, um, full full of self doubt on on every page that had to get hammered out through time and kind of exploring different ways. You know, one of the things that you said, I felt like it was very, I, you know, I tried to be very, very clear that he's leaving his community because he's, you know, sick of his mom and dad telling him what to do and he wants to get out of the house and, 
and, you know, see the bigger, bigger world. You know, I felt like I really, really made it clear that that was his motivation. Um, and then the, the other things kind of come after that, but I tried to keep it that the, in those first couple of chapters, I really, really tried to influence, uh, to, to, um, emphasize like, you know, the end of chapter one is him saying like, if the Quaker meeting was truly egalitarian, I wouldn't have a mother and father ruling over me. And, and um, so I thought it was important. So I, I feel like I, I um, these kinds of things, um, I am oh, oh, tr you know, planting in the in the book in a way that is appropriate from the perspective of that character as opposed to an outside force you know there's my i feel like my contribution is in the arrangement and also in the drawing kind of the inflection of a lot of this material about uh, about your the kind of second part of your question which is how um people will try to reduce something, I guess, on, on the internet or, you know, I always, I don't know um, what, the, I feel like the reaction, I'm not, I'm not sure that, you know, the books just come out. Um, so I haven't had to deal with that kind of, uh, also the book, it could be my fault, but the book is so weird and full of contradictory kind of information that I don't think of a, a, a um, reading, although I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of, you know, when you have something that has a lot of like literal negative space in it, you're really inviting people to, to fill it in. And if they mm. have something that they're bringing to it that they're upset with, they're gonna bring it to, to what you do. You know, I, I only say this, the only kind of time I've experienced this is on CryptoZoo in a pretty bizarre way because we have a, a character ta talking about storming the Capitol at the beginning of CryptoZoo and it was written in 2016 and we recorded Michael Sarah saying it in 2017 and then it came out two weeks after um, the January 6th attack, um, the, uh, you know, it was that, that Sundance was that, that month. Um, so you had this major thing that, uh, you know, is at minute six of the movie. Um, and it's, and, and I think that the fact that Sundance was virtual this year Maybe, I guess my point is an undigest, I, I couldn't have digested that being real as part of my project because, mm -hmm. it, I, because I didn't, it hadn't happened. Um, so then it's sort of this uh, beholder share kind of idea of the, the viewer completes the, the picture in their mind and I you know, gave them 70% and they're, picking the 30% of how they're, they're um, interpreting and filling out the material. Um, and uh, the, the, because that Sundance was virtual, it was at home. And I think it made it more like a reading experience where everyone kind of on their own had to decide, okay, wait, you know, what is this talking about here? Did, was this made before this just happened? Or like, what, like, Mm -hmm. What is it? What it? What? What's he? If if it if it had premiered, you know, um, in a festival full of a hundred people, I would have, everyone would have felt the ripple through the audience of I don't know what confusion or you know a bunch of people right. probably would have left because they would have been like this movie is crazy. Um, so the the reading experience I think maybe uh, benefits I think a. Uh, uh, an individual's um, attention. 
Uh, in terms of the space you leave uh, for a reader to make interpretations um, is, I think, quite generous in this book. Um, so it, it may be I already know the answer to this question, but but you know, comparing uh, discipline to a project like cosplayers, which is you know just a more lighthearted work, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, there, with discipline, to whatever extent you do, you do work to influence an interpretation. When when a work of yours has themes of uh, you know greater severity uh, or, or whatever, do you, do you find yourself working? harder to sort of, you know, to determine the parameters of someone's reading or in, in both cases is just your process that um, instinctively you you leave that space and, and make your peace with that. Well, it's, um, it's hard to talk in such an abstract way about it. Um, you know, the, the making things is, is, this is such an obvious thing to say, but just since we're talking so abstractly, I have to say it. It's uh, your relationship to the unseen reader. You know, how much do you do you trust this person? You know, do you love them? Do you do you not trust? Do you, are you concerned that you're not communicating this? Are you concerned that they um, are thinking? You know, you don't know them. They, uh, so what, what can be um, a real mind warp, again, this is something that I've experienced more with um, film than with books, is like you make your, your movie and you show it to people and you get the, you'll do maybe like a kind of test screening and of 12 people and five people didn't understand something and six other people got it. And then this one person thought it meant this other thing. And you're like, okay, how, what do I do with this information? Like, do I change it? Do I not change it? And that, and that decision um, is, I would say the hardest thing about directing, especially as you're working on something for so long. Um, and even if you don't have like an evil producer over you telling you to, telling you to change something, you still, you know, I, I work, on, on crypto with my wife, Jane, you know, my wife is telling me like, this line doesn't make sense or people think it, it do, doesn't, it does, does this, that and other. So I think ultimately um, the, the good thing about it um, taking so long is I did get to explore different options for how each of these things are handled. I'll pick a really basic one. Like we have two, two characters writing letters and at some point along the line, their handwriting is the same. I thought, well, I should have one of the characters have a different handwriting through the book so we know which letters are from the sister and which are from the brother because it's kind of confusing. Um, so then um, I, uh, I asked my mom who has great hand, um, lettering to do all of this lettering for, for Fanny's sister and I put it into the book um, and substituted out my lettering. But it felt, um, it didn't feel right. Then I, try, I did my, it in a, my own hand, but differently. So it's the same person, but I'm doing a slightly different inflection of the handwriting, but it felt too, much like now you know who's writing that letter, but mm -hmm. the extra attention of just of just recognizing that felt like a cute a clever thing. It felt too sure. clever. And it felt like it was weirdly distracting to the content of the book that I'd rather it just be text and remove the, the split second thought where you have to think, oh, this is from Fanny, then um, I would rather re remove that out and just have it float up. So many, you know, many people would have said, other people would have said, you can't do that, you know, because then you're, there's all this text, you don't know who it's coming from. Um, 
so I made that I made that uh, decision. Um, that's kind of an easier one to 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 cite as an example. No, but that makes sense though. Is is a conscious choice that you know a conscious challenge even that you know you are leaving for the reader to to work with. Um, we've got about five minutes until the Q and A section. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, because you've touched a bit on you know the parallel tracks of making comics and also directing animated films, um, I, I wanted to get sort of uh, granular, more granular with that um, because uh, throughout the book, even in, in non-combat scenes, let's say um, some of the compositions have you depicting motion, especially bodies in motion, um, in ways that I think are outside normal comics techniques. I'm thinking of the car dealing scene. Uh, at the military camp, you know, the cockfight scene soon after that, um, you know, the men brawling over a, a stolen knife. Um, there's a memorable coffin assembly scene later on. So I was wondering if directing animation has impacted how you approach motion in comics um, and in general, you know, how bound, how porous do you think the boundaries of those mediums are in terms of how one affects your approach and the other? The main, the about the bodies, you know, I feel like it's something that comics does very well in kind of like a Moybridge way where it can really shoot meaning into um, physical action when it, uh, so, you know, for each of those things you like, you could make, I don't, it and and shoot you know shooting meaning can uh, means different things depending on the on the scene, um, but uh, the may, maybe animation has something to do with that. I'm not sure. You know, in animation, it's it's so different because it's not occupying the same space. It's going through time. Um, I think that the main uh, thing that film has taught me is. Um, editing, and uh, because most comics are not edited, they they don't get that opportunity because of how they're they're made. Meaning, I know they are edited by like an editor who's making suggestions to the story or the pencils or something. But I mean, um, whole scenes are not rearranged and and uh, restructured the way the way they are in editing rooms of films. Um, so like in this book, there's all of this stuff where the meeting house is debating about um, how much of the taxes to pay or whether or not to pay taxes that are going towards the military. Um, and that, little, that kind of piece came from these friends journals that I found kind of late in the, in the process. I can't. Um, and when I figured out how to dramatize that, I then like laid it into these other scenes and it felt like it the book like finally felt like a book and not mm -hmm. just a long collage all right well we're at uh 8 14 now uh but in the interest of giving everybody uh uh you know uh 15 minutes plus for the q a section i'm going to segue uh over to some of those questions now um Vince asks, uh, your graphic novel beautifully captures the Quaker ethos, particularly in the meeting house scenes. To what extent do you believe that the theme of the inner light plays a central role in your story? Well, um, you know, in the story, it's there's even a kind of joke in one of the earlier scenes where the boy's like, um, this spirit does not move me to attend. Like he does, you know. And so I feel like that's kind of establishing that that you can have some a voice inside of you that's giving you contradictory information. Um, and that's the thing that that uh, again is maybe something that um, the the having been raised Quaker and someone very early kind of talking to you about an inner light and being, being uh, seeing it in kind of an art school kind of perspective of like your inner voice or, you know, your own um, 
an, insp an inspirational source inside of you. Um, but it's still, and I think that this is maybe the exciting or radical part about Quaker meeting that it's a community, it's inside of a community, you know? And so your inner voice is calling you to speak up inside of this group. It isn't like uh, meditation. Um, or a soul, I, I, mean, I guess I shouldn't say that, but a, a solo endeavor. Um, so I, I, get, I mean, I think, I think it, it is in the, in the book. Now, uh, Jose asked, uh, what's it been like doing a couple of animated films, uh, which you've spoken on to a point. Um, so maybe I, if Jose uh, will forgive me, um, I'll, I'll modify that one slightly to ask, uh, both Discipline and CryptoZoo were projects that, that took years and, and paralleled each other um, to some degree, but uh, don't resemble each other uh, well at all. So I, I, um, I'm wondering if you'd be able to answer instead, you know, what was it like working on simultaneously on those two projects that superficially at least, uh, yeah, are, are not, not very much alike? Um. Well, I started Discipline so long ago, and um, because of some of all of the things you mentioned and and other, it 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 just um, I kept quitting it and thinking I wasn't never going to pick it up. You know, a section of it ran in Kramer Zergat in twenty sixteen. And I remember sometime I had turned it into the editor and then I thought, okay, that's it. You know, that excerpt might be the only time that any of that book appears because I don't think I can finish it. I don't think there's a whole book. I read my headspace really does not want to be in the civil war right now, you know, forget this. Um, so, but then when I got it, um, that when I saw it printed in, in that anthology, it, it got me a little more excited about it again. Um, and it made me go back and look at my material. Then, so the point, the point it could have been anything. I could have been working on, you know, furniture or something, but it's uh, discipline would have still um, been kind of difficult and um, plague my thoughts. Now, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, can you talk about the prison escape scene? Can you talk about the prison escape scene? Um, can I talk about it? I mean, I don't know how much to say. It felt a little, I, I felt like I the text that it's paired with, it would be so um, uh, absurd to try to explain why a certain kind of text aligning with pictures makes a third thing that is more than the sum of its parts. But I felt like the text with that scene made a third thing that was meaningful um, to at that part. And so it made it felt justified in my um, in, in a, being a part of the book. Yeah, that's the best I can say. Now, let me ask as just a, uh, for the, um, as a point of fact, uh, in that scene, are you, are you integrating, uh, you know, diary entries from someone who had actually escaped from a Confederate prison? Not for the escape scene itself. That is a very famous, the Libby prison breakout is a very famous moment. There's, um, I tried to, I think, cite them in the back of the book, a couple um, books about that moment. But the, 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 in, there's text that's being imprisoned, and then I have text unrelated to a breakout that happens when they're escaping. That, yeah, I feel like if I articulate it, I'm trying to maybe point to um, juxtapositions that are um, making non-literal connections between things. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I don't know if you're looking at the, the Q&A as well. We have a couple questions uh, generally about um, art and text in your work. One is uh, from Bill, what comes first for you, the text or the illustrations uh, and the challenges in building with both forms. Uh, another question, people talk about storytelling in relation to your work. What do you think about that phrase and how do you see it related between textual works and illustrated ones? Well, I'll try to I'll try to blab about these. You know, one is that um, the the I always have the story idea first before I'm figuring out how to draw it, and that usually means it's text because my sketchbook will be like ideas for what maybe the next story might be. Um, so that's different than the text and the illustrations. And um, for Bill's question about the text and illustrations, that kind of talks about that um, the prison scene where uh, ideally this book is in the juxtaposition. So I would get the kind of material for like for like for example, well, I got a lot, you know, there's the, the diagrams of Libby prison are everywhere and, and all, all the books about Libby prison have those diagrams, but you know, another scene is um, them building this crazy pontoon bridge. Um, and they had the actual pontoon bridge construction diagrams at the New York Public Library. So I got them and I just spent a few few days drawing this, this bridge construction. And I didn't know what text would go over it or if it would even be a scene in the book. Um, but then when I found this other text that aligned with it, I was like, okay, this is making a third thing. I, you know, the text, again, if I tried to articulate it, I don't even know if I could. Um, you know, the, the, the part in the breakout, I think it's um, the character talking about basically find, um, a, a lack of, oh man, I don't even know if I could, you know, a lack of free will and that basically it's up to, um, to you're you're in the hands of others who are going to save you or not save you and the the text during the um the pontoon building construction i think has something to do with um how people from the future will look back at what is what we're writing and judge us not by what we're writing but by what we're doing and that coupled with constructing something in time and space across waters like here again, if I try to articulate it, it sounds so cheesy, but you know, when I'm just pairing these pictures with these words, I felt like, ah, this feels right. You know, these two things exist separately, but when I put them together, they don't look, they don't feel like they're exactly, one is not exactly illustrating the other. If it was so clear, I feel like I'm making a connection for you, which is maybe what I did when I just tried to explain it. But if they feel like two things that are existing separately and they align, you know, it's like a, it's like a rhyme in the, and it's like, these are two words that mean different things, but the sound and when they're placed in this moment, you know, the formal properties of them are making a unex ideally unexpected connection. If the expectation is, is, if the connection is expected, it loses some of that moment of inspiration. These are hard questions. I hope I. Um... And I think that circles back to what you were saying earlier about leaving the space for the reader too, like the, the um, you know, the intensity or the pungency of that, you know, uh, the frizzin or the the irony there. A lot of that I think depends on on who's reading it. Um, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's the, it's sort of, yes, it, what you're saying is true and not true. Like um, it, in that beholder share percentage, you know, how much is me and how much, I think I have most of the percentage. <laughs> right. And you, know, and you can say, like there's something, you know, David, David Lynch famously was like, every inter interpretation is true. And, you know, I just, when, whenever he would say that, I think that's not true. You can't, <laughs> you can't, you know, watch a racer head and be like, it's about Coke versus Pepsi or something like, it's just not, you know? Um, so the, the parameters are set and there's room inside of those 
parameters, but um, if I can definitely say sometimes if someone is interpreting something, I can I can point and say that's not true. Like like look, if you're 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 there's some some extra imagination is taking place. Anyway. <laughs> Um, um, Jeff asked about, can you talk about working with New York Review Comics? I understand that they have done more translations and reprints. I'm wondering how working on a brand new project for them may have been different from working with other publishers. And we'll say it's, um, it's uh, 826 now, so I, we may have to treat this as the last question. Um, New York Review of Comics, uh, well, First, I loved the other books that they had done. Um, of course, I loved the New York Review books. I thought it was amazing and super cool that they would start publishing um, graphic novels, comics, and kind of like what many people I'm sure thought when they announced their line, I thought how many, you know, undiscovered, you know, untranslated graphic novels could there be? You know, are, isn't, aren't fanographics and drawn and quarterly pretty much covering all of their all of the bases on reprinting every single you know buzz sawyer and everything um but their line that um lucas and gabe were doing was so smart and what was especially appealing to me um is that they the context of the new york review of books of course um but also they only do four or so graphic novels a year. Um, and uh, I don't have a million Twitter followers, followers, a million Instagram followers. I, you know, dropped off the radar to work on these things. I didn't do a good job. So I really like the idea of someone who would kind of give me the special attention of it being their only book for that quarter, their only graphic novel for that quarter. Okay, and Community Bookstore says we have time to take that one last question. Uh, this is from another anonymous attendee. In injecting a Quaker into the Civil War, what do you want us to learn from your book? What is your larger message? Well, I, didn't feel like I, I, I feel like I didn't inject this one. They were, they were already there. They were there. And I, and, you know, the, the kind of larger question, question, it's the kind of thing where if, um, if I could say it in these two minutes that I have in the, in the form of words in this interview, it, I wouldn't have spent all of these years trying to figure out and um, put it into a book. Um, but, I, but that being said, that sounds like a cop out or a dodge of your question. And I think, it, I think the, the content of the book is something about um, what people are thinking or the ideals in one's head versus what people are doing physically with their bodies. And um, how do you, uh, rec how, how those two things align or don't align? Should they align? Should they not align? Does it matter if they align? Um, that's, that's, that's uh, um, about as good as I can do for, for a short, a short uh, answer to that question. It's a big question. And thank you so much for taking the moment to, to address it. And for this really wonderful conversation overall, both of you, this was so, such a pleasure for us. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of Discipline from Community Bookstore. We hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thanks for joining us again. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Thank you.